My golly, I want to congratulate everyone here. You know why? You're a member of the most magnificent species, Homo sapiens. And what does that mean? Wise human. Go on, look at each other. Take a bow. Isn't it marvellous? <laughs> we are the greatest, the wisest, the most powerful and the most dangerous species on Earth. And possibly the cosmos, we don't know. And yet, we're such a recent invention in evolutionary terms. We haven't been around very long. Yet, in an incredibly short space of time, we've gone from a primitive, axe-bearing ape to, sorry about this, a sophisticated human, just like you, all wielding a mobile phone. Aren't we smart? This is great. <laughs> but, but, how did we do it? And how did we do it so quickly? Very simple. We did it on the back of education. Education, handing down of ideas from person to person, building them up. That's what gave us our great advantage in civilization. Education has served us incredibly well in the past, but, and this is a big but, is it serving us well now and into the future? We think not really, because there's some important ingredient missing. Wisdom, the sapiens behind Homo sapiens. Now, let's begin on the journey and just expand that idea a little bit. Let us think. We actually evolved on this planet about 200,000 years ago, which is not very long in evolutionary terms. We were very weak, little, naked apes, totally at the mercy of environment. We almost died out 70,000 years ago. We didn't. We were lucky. We had very bright little minds. We were very clever. And because of that, we gradually got control of our environment. 10,000 years ago, we invented agriculture. Suddenly, we had a food surplus, food security. And because of that, we could suddenly start to breed, build our numbers up like you people here. We could stratify our, our community. And think about that. Our early communities, maybe this lot over here in the audience, you became stratified into the serfs, the workers, the laborers, the slaves. You made all the profits, you made all the, sorry, you made all the, the work. This little group over here, the middle class, if you like, you became the teachers, the merchants, the thinkers. And you, four people over there, you know who you were? Yes, right, I, I mean you. You were the elite. You were the princes. You were the high priests. You were the chief executive officers, living off the fat of the land. Right. Stratification was a great thing. Despite the inequality, it meant we could build civilizations. And we did. Marvellous civilizations. We all started to live longer, happier lives. And gradually, 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 we built great monuments, great cities. Look at that city carefully. It's full of little naked apes just like you and just like you now wearing clothes. And that's all we are, little naked apes. Can I put the stone down? Thank you. Now, <laughs> this did come at a cost, a very high price. And as everyone here probably realizes, we are living beyond our means. The earth cannot support us. We know that. We've got to change our lifestyles. We know that. But we're not doing it. Is that wise? And let me go further. Two incredible idiocies that we've done. 70 years ago, we harnessed the atom. And what do we do? We made two big bombs. And what do we do with those bombs? We dropped them on ourselves in Japan. We did. We killed 150,000 people just like that. Horrified, appalled, disgusted. And so what did we do? we built another 20,000 bigger bombs. Incredible. And we still have 8,000 of them. And you know what we call them? A balance of terror, mutually assured destruction, acronym MAD. And you call us Homo sapiens. And you know that we're mining our fossil fuels, throwing them up in the air, 
changing our climate. We know that. And we know we could do something about it. But are we? No. We're just wrangling, we're just discussing, we're just thinking. Is that wise? Okay, have I made the point? Homo sapiens, are we wise? Well, no, we're not. We're very clever, genetically endowed, we have great minds. But do we have wisdom? No. Wisdom is not within our minds. Wisdom is not genetically endowed. We never had the wisdom to cope with things like this. Wisdom has to be nurtured. We get nurture through education. Education is what we must have if we're going to cope with the future. Now, let's move on to education then. Amazing. Education, particularly over the last 300 years, has boomed. Everyone here has been dragooned through schools and probably universities. You've been stuck in these institutes like little academic sausages coming out the other end. <laughs> and hopefully, you've learned something. But I challenge you, have you learned wisdom? Let me ask you a question. In all of your years and years of sitting in those schools, sitting in those university halls, did anyone ever ask you or encourage you to think, what will the world be like in 50 years' time? What sort of a world would you like to have in 50 years' time? And what could you do to make that happen? Did anyone get that sort of information? Come on, there must be someone. Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> now, that's interesting. You're one of the youngest members here, and I think you're right, because I think it's quite possible our primary schools and our lovely teachers are beginning to inculcate these ideas into education, and I'm so grateful. It is happening. It's just that we want it to happen faster. When we get onto universities, it's happening ever so slowly. It really is. Easiest way to describe this. The world has problems. Universities have disciplines. They're not meshing. We've got to go beyond disciplines. And so, I and a number of colleagues about 10, over 10 years ago now, felt that we've got to make a change. We've got to educate in a different way. We've got to bring wisdom back into our halls of learning. And so we decided two things. Firstly, that we work very, very hard to create curricula, like you might be getting in primary schools, curricula specifically trying to enhance and enable wisdom to flourish. And the second thing we felt was terribly important is that we must learn to link up with each other all around the world, working with similar groups like us, working with primary school teachers, working with secondary school teachers. Collectively, although we don't have much power yet, we just might be able to make a difference and get wisdom back where it belongs in our halls of learning. So, let us move on and think about what we actually did. Let us think, how do, we, how do you create curricula where wisdom is not taught? You cannot teach wisdom, but you can nourish it. You can allow it to flower. It does so naturally in such a beautiful lot of students. First of all, we had to define wisdom. And again, um, when I wandered around my university and said, look, what, what, what's wisdom? And remember, my university's motto is seek wisdom. If I wander around my students, and a lot of you, a lot of you went through my university, I suspect. Most of you don't even know what the motto was. And even if you do, when I ask you, marvellous, you got the motto, now tell me, please, what is wisdom? And I get silence. So, what is wisdom? Think. Well, I don't know. But I think we can try to get a working definition. And it does imply knowledge and know-how, but it also implies values, human values. And it also must imply action. Knowledge and values without action is not wisdom. OK, so we started to get a bit of a working definition of wisdom. And then we said, right, now let's create a curriculum where that wisdom can flourish. Well. What are we going to do? Ah, surely the most important thing is human well-being. Isn't that marvellous? Well, of course, we'd all agree with that. Homo sapiens would be wrapped if we brought in curricula where we were looking after human well-being. 
And we also realize, and you all do here too, that human well-being is impossible unless you couple it with the environment. Bring those two things together and we're really starting to get somewhere. So here we are, we develop curricula about well-being and sustainability, and on top of that, we promoted them to think about human and world futures. We've got to get them thinking about the future and engaging with the future. So they were the prime things we were doing. And that was great. But I tell you what, some of my rather hard-nosed academic colleagues felt, that's crazy. All you're really doing is coming up with motherhood statements, and you can't do that at universities. And our reply is, well, yes, you're right. In the first instance, motherhood. Mothers give life. They give birth. Mothers love their children. They nurture them. Their whole essence is well-being of their children. So if you want to call us motherhood, well, we're proud to be associated with motherhood. Yes, of course. What about the academic challenge? We maintain that these ideas are not easy. They're very, very difficult. Human well-being demands that you understand philosophy, psychology, sociology, science, economics. We must bring all those together, bring them together, weave them together to really understand human well-being. Not an easy task, a very challenging task, but a very rewarding task. Okay, and over all of this, we must realize when we're giving these sort of courses that we must offer hope and enthusiasm. Too often, we look at the problems of the world and get defeated. We must go beyond that. So, we have developed courses, and they're working well. I just want to show you, not our courses, but someone here, Michael Graffin, who spoke very briefly last year, his job is to get people working together, primary school teachers working together on the internet around the world. I think that's absolutely laudable. And as he puts it, we are not here to learn about each other, we're here to learn with each other. And that's what it's all about. On that panel on the bottom left, this is one of my colleagues, Angela Jantz. She is teaching postgraduate courses, if you like, in wisdom to people all around the world on the internet, totally online. That panel on the right, these are my first year students that I work with. They are doing a subject called Humanity in the 21st Century and Human Action for World Futures. They're a marvelous group to work with. They understand what we're talking about. And when they posed for me like this, I said, look, please, please, look as if you're enjoying the course. And <laughs> They kind of manage that. And then I asked them a much harder question. Look as if you're wise. <laughs> you go home tonight, look in the mirror and see if you can do it. It's not easy. However, we know these courses work. We know they're appropriate. We know the students love them. We think we're accruing wisdom. But we have a problem. Just like everyone else working in these areas around the world, we're on the periphery. We're sort of tolerated, but not much more than that. We want to think that wisdom is mainstream in our universities and schools. And we need your help. We need you students to, to, to talk to your lecturers and demand it. We need everyone here and everyone watching. Just look at this slide. That is a group of people marching. We had it a month ago. Marvelous, a whole lot of very wise people working for the future. Just imagine if we could harness you and everyone else like you to placard yourselves with, we want wisdom and we want it now. <laughs> go to your universities, pick it, go to your politicians, ask them, get wisdom back into our halls of education. Please help us there. Now, just imagine you're doing all of that. And I want you to really stretch your imagination. There's a blank screen. Put on that blank screen all your favoured and least favoured politicians, all your favoured and least favoured religious leaders, all your favoured and least favoured CEOs, your bosses and yourselves. Now just think, 
If you'd all had the advantages of an education for world futures, we could then truly call ourselves Homo sapiens. And with our wisdom and our action, what a wonderful world. Thank you.